Welcome to the first episode of our new webinar series, Diversities Matters, where we explore the impact of migrations, diversities and mobilities on increasingly super diverse territories. The webinar series is hosted by the research group Migrations and Diversity here at Eurac Research, and each month a Eurac colleague of mine explores one particular theme with two or three distinguished guests. Topics that range from migration, agriculture and rural development to health, diversity and of course COVID-19. And not to forget to integration policies in autonomous territories. My name is Kerstin Wonisch and it's my pleasure, um, it's my great pleasure to moderate today's uh, first episode that tackles the dimension of indigenous urbanization and mobility, identity, resilience, resilience, and, resilience and rights. Many indigenous peoples are on the move, with cities representing a primary destination. This may be due to territorial displacement, degradation, conflict or exploitation, or to other socio socioeconomic and environmental factors. Internal and transnational migration and mobility trends are particularly evident in the case of Latin America, but also in Europe. In addition to rural to urban migration, the territories of indigenous peoples are in also increasingly affected by urbanization processes, such as urban expansion, rural to urban land conversions and large scale infrastructure projects. Against this background, today our esteemed speakers will discuss the impact of these processes on indigenous, indigenous identity, rights and resilience, as said in Latin America and Europe. Emphasis will also be paid to the current challenges caused by the pandemic and of course to climate change. Our speakers will each share their insights for around 10 minutes, followed by approximately 20 minutes of questions and answers. Um, of course, this is a webinar, so all our esteemed participants are mu muted, however, um, you can still interact with the speakers. In order to do so, please pose your questions into the Q&A section. The chat is not meant uh, to interact with the participants. Um, by the chat, we only can communicate uh, basic information to, to the audience, but not uh, the audience interact with the speakers. So once again, please, if you want to pose questions, ask something to the speakers, use the Q&A function. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to our guest speakers today. Um, the first one is uh, Dr. Philip Horn. He's a lecturer in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the University of Sheffield. His re research centers around topics of urban indigeneity, territorial conflict and participatory planning with a focus on Latin America. He is author of the book Indigenous Rights to the City, Ethnicity and Urban Planning in Bolivia and Ecuador, published with Routledge. And currently he leads an ECRS RC new investigator project entitled Indigenous Developments Alter Development Alternatives and Urban Youth Perspective from Bolivia. Philip, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Furthermore, we have. <laughs> Furthermore, we have Dr. Claire Wright. She's a research fellow at the School of Law at uh, Queen's University in Belfast, where she's working on a project to analyze the relevance of colonial legacies for present-day peace-building processes. Prior to taking up her post at Queen's, Claire worked as a lecturer in Mexico for seven years, first at Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León, and then at Universidad de Monterrey. Claire's research focuses on the political participation of indigenous peoples and emergency powers in Latin America. With Alexandra Tomaselli, our third speaker, she's the co-auditor of, of the book Pri The Prior Consultation of Indigenous Peoples, Inside the Implementation Gap, published with Routledge in 2019. Claire, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. And finally, last but not least, we have my esteemed colleague on the panel, Dr. Alexandra Tomaselli. She's a re senior researcher here at the Institute for Minority Rights at Europe Bolzano. Her research uh, foci actually include human and indigenous people's rights, linguistic and national minorities, stateless nations, and more recently, intersectionality, gender, and SDGs in Europe and Latin America. Among her recent publications are Challenges to Indigenous Political and Socioeconomic Participation, Natural Resources, Sources, gender education and intellectual property, which is an Europe open access ebook uh, published in 2017, and they co edited a collection together with uh, Clear, as mentioned, the prior consultation of indigenous people with Routledge. Now, without further ado, um, I will give uh, the floor now to Philip for his introductory statement. Philip, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Kerstin. Um, I will quickly share my screen and just 
There we go. Well, first of all, thank you very much to Jurok and especially to Alexandra for the kind invitation and for organizing a seminar on indigenous urbanization and mobility, which uh, uh, is a very pertinent topic uh, and uh, really, really uh, there's a strong need for, for further uh, research uh, in this emerging field. Uh, in this very short provocation, I would really like to make two central points is, uh, and the first point is that uh, conventional understandings uh, and dominant political and legal representations of indigeneity continue in many ways to be guided by a rural bias. Uh, and the second point really is that uh, this unfortunately contradicts the lived reality of a growing indigenous majority that lives in urban areas. So in this talk, I'll reflect on both of these elements uh, and then also highlight some wider indigenous urbanization patterns before then handing over to Claire and Alexandra and uh, hopefully clarifying many of your questions in the Q&A. So uh, as said, Conventionally, indigeneity is oftentimes conceived as the antithesis to the urban. And uh, in my own writing, uh, I trace the origins of this, of this issue back to the colonial conquest, uh, in, uh, when the Spanish colonizers essentially spatially divided the Americas, conceiving of urban spaces as white spaces from which to administer the colonial uh, hinterlands. Uh, and also spaces in which universal rights to a certain degree applied, uh, and the hinterlands being conceived of as indigenous spaces where native population groups oftentimes lived in semi-feudal conditions, uh, were denied from citizenship, but certainly granted some levels of autonomy. So this is a Latin American perspective, uh, but I also include here a book by Libby Porter, which uh, makes a similar though slightly contextually different argument uh, for, for North America, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, so it's important to keep these colonial roots in mind. Uh, and the argument really is that present day legal definitions reproduce in many ways this colonial imaginary by associating indigenous peoples and their rights with specific places and territories, oftentimes associated with natural habitat and rurality. This is evident uh, in the United Nations Declaration for Indigenous Peoples. Uh, it is also evident in campaigns such as the recent one by the Ford Foundation, uh, which focuses on uh, claims of authenticity and uh, uh, by highlighting Indigenous peoples as protectors of the forest. But it's also evident in countries' own uh, constitutional frameworks. So for example, in Bolivia, the country in which I'm doing quite a bit of my own work, uh, indigenous rights are uh, represented through a native indigenous peasant category. Uh, and I argue in my, my work um, that, that this focus on the native and the peasant in particular uh, denies the urban presence of indigenous peoples. And that has very practical consequences in the sense that particular indigenous rights, either around the right to prior consultation, to autonomy, uh, to land, are oftentimes not respected in urban settings. And I consider this to be a problem because in the past, in the present, but also likely in the future, indigenous peoples always uh, had, a, had a very strong and growing urban presence. So let us begin with the past. So again, if we look into the history of the Americas uh, and into the pre-colonial period, we can, we can trace the history of uh, very, very big urban settlements uh, which, which existed prior to the colonial conquest. Uh, we've also got uh, work, for example, in Bolivia by Javier Albon, Alfredo Sandoval, and Thomas Greaves, which highlights that the construction of the colonial city was very much an outcome of indigenous labor, and that indigenous peoples never really left the city behind. They engaged in market relations, they might have lived uh, on the city's edge. And it's really this strong tie to the city that, that defines many urban indigenous movements that are emerging at present across the Americas. So I work, for example, in the city of Santa Cruz in Bolivia, where uh, young people, young indigenous peoples have recently uh, uh, undertaken a campaign which is called Nunca Nos Fuimos, really highlighting their historical and ongoing presence within urban centers, however, in the context of the present denial of specific rights for indigenous peoples in cities. So here, just some contemporary trends. Uh, I've put this together uh, by reviewing uh, census data from different countries, but also drawing on a UN Habitat report on indigenous migration 
2010. Uh, and what we can really see here is that uh, indigenous peoples live in cities. The blue figures highlight uh, this trend. This trend is growing and is likely here to stay. Uh, and we can observe regional variations, but it's also important, and uh, for that reason, I'm focusing on youth, particularly in my current work, that we uh, can observe intergenerational differences. So um, again, in South America, predominantly, it is the youth that represent the urban indigenous majority. Uh, so in a context like Bolivia, where 48% of indigenous peoples live in cities, this figure is much higher if we would look at uh, an age group uh, between 18 to 30, for example. It's worthwhile highlighting that there's also some limitations. So uh, in these figures, uh, different countries have a different understanding of what counts as a city. Um, there's also distinct uh, measurements of indigeneity, and it's worthwhile noting uh, that probably there's an underrepresentation of indigenous peoples in urban areas. In many countries, uh, indigeneity is measured uh, in censuses through language use, uh, and it's widely noted uh, that indigenous peoples in cities, while identifying as indigenous, might no longer practice their language. Um, and there's also a lack of statistical data uh, for African and Asian countries. Uh, for example, in India, uh, indigenous peoples are considered to be scheduled tribes. Uh, and this category is not formal, formally recognized within statistical representations. So for that reason, a bit of a hint of warning uh, to, to treat these figures carefully. Let me now reflect briefly for the last three and a half minutes or so on different indigenous urbanization trends. So there's a huge literature by now, uh, both in Latin America, but also in the global north uh, on rural to urban migration, which is oftentimes portrayed as a dominant trend. Indigenous peoples moving to the, to the city for a variety of reasons, uh, be that in search of employment, education, connecting with a family that already lives there, many indigenous movements themselves, and their political centers within cities. Um, and uh, that is another core reason. But then there's also push factors uh, and I'm listing a couple of those here. I'm also listing uh, the 2010 UN Habitat Report, uh, which provides, I think, to date, one of the best global overviews on the topic. Um, but I would like to focus the last couple of minutes also on a more broader understanding of uh, what we should consider indigenous urbanization. So there's the migration of people towards cities, but then there's also the arrival of urban features within indigenous territory. So within the discipline of urban studies, uh, in which I am situated, um, in recent years there has been a strong focus on patterns of urbanization processes and their effects on the countryside. Uh, and in Latin America and across the world, indigenous territories are not exempt from that. So in La Paz, uh, I've recently, for example, published an article in urban studies, which looks into the expansion of the city of La Paz into indigenous territories at its periphery. Uh, but more importantly, um, we can also notice the urbanization, urbanization features or urban features in areas that are traditionally considered to be rural or associated uh, with naturally prot uh, protected zones. In urban studies, this is referred to as extended or planetary urbanization. And in Latin America, regional initiatives, such as the Initiative for the Integration uh, of Regional Infrastructure in South America, IRSA, uh, can be considered a paradigmatic example of this trend. So here we can observe large-scale infrastructure projects centering around ports, airports, bridges, tunnels, roads, railways, new towns that are emerging in areas considered to be associated with the countryside and indigenous territories. In Bolivia, a case in point, for example, is the road construction process in the Tignes territory, the construction of a mega dam in the Balachapeta Amazonian region. Outside of Latin America, paradigmatic examples are the Silk Road Economic Belt Initiative uh, or also the Lamo Port South Sudan Ethiopia Transport Corridor, which again transgresses through indigenous territories and could be considered as a way of urbanizing these lands. I want to finish with one final provocation uh, and the need to perhaps think beyond the focus on associating indigeneity with rurality, recognizing just the increasing presence in the urban, but actually uh, a perspective that encompasses both of these worlds uh, and recognizes the multi-locality uh, that characterizes many indigenous peoples across the globe. So I'm uh, citing here 
uh, a book which I find quite influential on this topic by Nelson Antequera Duran and Cristina Cielo, Ciudad Sin Fronteras, where they focus on the multiple and important links indigenous peoples maintain with families and communities in very different places, oftentimes demonstrating that they have one foot in the city, for example, to trade good, goods on the markets, to access education, to access better uh, housing uh, and services associated with this, but at the same time preserving ties to their rural territories, going there for festivals, participating in the harvest, perhaps at times even engaging in international trade, commercial, and educational relations. Uh, and from this, we can really sort of uh, develop an understanding of indigenous territoriality, which is expanded and not confined to neither the rural nor the urban, but associated with the multiplicity of ecological and socioeconomic spaces. Uh, the Andean notion of the Ailu perhaps represents this uh, in very neat ways. So let me finish uh, with a couple of further sources. Um, by coincidence, today, uh, a special issue which we've edited with uh, my colleagues Aiko Ikrimo Ramara and this week, Poets, has been out and published in the Bulletin of Latin American Research here. It's a variety of articles on indigenous urbanization in Latin America. My book, uh, I put the link here as well, and I can put it in the chat, and also a couple of links to research initiatives that exist on the topic. Uh, so I hope that provided a decent introduction, uh, and I now hand over. To, to colleagues and look forward to answering questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Philip, for this uh, thorough overview of the topic and providing us for, uh, with first insights into the reasons for the rural urban, urban migration and for the urbanization of rural indigenous territories. It's my pleasure now to hand over to Claire for her introductory statements. Please, Claire, the floor is all yours. Um, thank you so much, Kirsten. Likewise, like Philip, I'd like to take the chance to, to thank Yurak, uh, Alexander Domaselli, and other colleagues for the kind invitation to participate in this seminar. Um, it's a really, really important topic, as Philip was saying. Indigenous people have lived in urban centres for a long, long time. Obviously, there are new movements and new um, migratory dynamics, um, but the kind of popular imagination hasn't caught up with reality. And I think it's really important that we're talking about this issue and um, trying to give some pointers about the dimensions of um, the urbanization of indigenous peoples um, and the implications of this um, continuous process. So for me, it's a real pleasure um, to participate in this webinar with such distinguished colleagues um, and friends for me of mine. Um, so what I'd like to share with you now, following on very much from Philip's presentation and work, um, are some reflections based on my experience living um, two hours away from the US border when I lived in Mexico, Monterrey. Um, I'd like to share sort of two um, sort of general observations or, or situations with you. One is um, the situation of indigenous migrants in the United States, so the, the ones who cross borders, um, and another one, uh, another sort of uh, series of uh, reflections on the situation of um, indigenous migrants internally in Mexico um, to, to urban areas. And what am I interested in talking about in both contexts, I suppose, is um, the participation and the political organization of migrants once they've, they've moved um, to different urban areas. Um, following on Philip's work um, very much, he talks about this idea of um, Indigenous people reconfigurating certain um, networks um, within the cities. And I think it's really important to, to touch on that as well as new dynamics and the creation of new um, networks. And there's a, an idea that's kind of lit little light bulb up in my head um, of this notion of the city being a very colonial space um, in terms of how race is organized and how the city is thought of and the implications of that for indigenous um, urbanization. So um, in the eight minutes I have left, I'd like to talk about these two contexts um, and the issue of sort of political organization. Um, the first context of indigenous uh, migration to the US, we know that the Mexican border is the most transited border um, in the entire world. What we hear about in the news a lot are processes of of um, irregular migration, mainly from people from um, Mexico and Central America, also Cuba and Haiti, um, to, to the US. And within um, that group of people migrating in that way, um, there are there's a considerable portion of um, indigenous speaking uh, migrants. It's very difficult to, to think of numbers, but currently there are 337 cases of asylum seekers stuck in the US courts. Um, and there have been several news articles on this in the States recently because the reason they're stuck, one of the reasons, um, is the lack of translators who are able to deal with these cases. So people who don't necessarily speak Spanish, they speak their indigenous languages and the American system can't cope with this. Um, so currently that's the big issue regarding indigenous migration in the US, but historically talking about the last 20, 30 years, when we think of indigenous migration from or through Mexico to the US, we think out of California, 
um, and the number of indigenous migrants in Oaxaca, Michoacán, Guerrero, particularly in Mexico, going to work in California, either in the fields or in the cities. And what I wanted to point out is that Los Angeles has become a real center of political organization um, for indigenous migrants in in the US, particularly from Mexico and um, from elsewhere. Um, at the last count, there were 14 organizations working um, in favor of indigenous rights within Los Angeles. Um, and the biggest one historically, the most important one would be the Frente Indigena uh, de Organizaciones um, Binacionales. And this particular organization is interesting because it works very much as um, Philip was talking about multi-locality. It works very much according to the logic of multi-locality. Um, so promoting, social rights particularly of indigenous people um, within the states and within California particularly and also trying to have a sort of positive incidence um, in terms of um, cultural and social rights in, in Mexico so that's a very very interesting uh, case and like I said this is all um, revolving around Los Angeles as a centre of um, migration and political organisation um, and another recent development in terms of this sort of historic um, migration of indigenous people to um, California is in 2019, the Mexican government carried out a series of um, consultations on the, the proposal for constitutional reform for indigenous and Afro-Mexicans, um, which is currently going through the, the works in the Congress. Um, and there was a consultation forum carried out in Los Angeles, again, um, with the migrant community, because it's considered a really big political pressure group within Mexico itself. So the same sort of consultation that was going on in Mexico was also carried out um, in Los Angeles. And again, as a result of this consultation, obviously there was a lot said about the situation in Mexico and the proposal for the constitutional reform, but there was also a considerable amount said in terms of the United States and the situation in California for indigenous people. Um, and there was an idea of talking about sort of bilateral initiatives. So I think um, in terms of this migration from Mexico to the US, there's so much to say, but in terms of urbanization and um, political participation, the case of um, indigenous organizations who literally are binational organizations um, working outside of, out of um, Los Angeles is a really interesting case, particularly bearing in mind Philip's comment about um, multi-locality. So that was what I wanted to say about um, that particular context. The other context, which I know much better because I still live through it, is the context of Mexico and internal migration um, of indigenous people in Mexico. According to Philip's data, and they, they look good to me, it's about 50% of indigenous people in, in Mexico live in the cities. Um, and this process of urbanization is increasing um, every time there are census um, data. It, there's always a bigger percentage of indigenous people living in cities. Sometimes that's because of um, violence, they're forced off their territories because of violence. Uh, a lot of times it's because of the, the need to find different um, alternatives for work um, and due to family networks. I lived in, in Monterrey, which is a city in the state of Nuevo León, which is northeast Mexico. And according to data from the 2015 sort of intercensal count, it was over 400,000 people in that city self-identify self as um, indigenous, sorry, in the state of Nuevo León, self-identify as indigenous. Now, 400,000 people, so a lot of people, if we think of uh, that, it's bigger than many of the, most of the municipalities in Oaxaca that are organized according to Sistemas Normativos Internos, the, the traditional um, indigenous uh, political and justice system. Um, that, that's a lot of people. Um, and this whole process began in the 1990s. Obviously the data and the way things are measured changes every time, um, but it was really the 90s that this process of migration started. So we're talking about 30 years um, from going from a very, very small indigenous migrant community to a massive indigenous migrant community. Um, there's a lot to say about this, um, but what can we say in terms of sort of political organization of these people? What happens when they, they become urbanized and, and go to the city? Well, um, in my experience, there's four things that have happened, um, particularly Monterrey in the big city that takes up a big part of um, Nuevo León. One thing is you have the emergence of um, civil society organizations who are registered formally with the state who sort of become part of the constellation of different organizations working around the local um, government, both state and municipal government um, uh, authorities. And that's a really interesting phenomenon to look at because a lot of the people organizing these NGOs or civil society organizations are younger. Um, indigenous leaders who have studied at university, um, who've got links with other human rights um, networks. And it's quite interesting to the dynamics between them. Um, obviously, a lot of them are sort of fighting for social justice. Um, 
But there's also a very, very interesting dynamic in terms of how the fight for resources affect the relationships between these organizations. Um, and very often there's a kind of division between them. I find that very interesting to study um, and, and, and to live with. Um, but there's I said, quite a buoyant, I don't know if it's healthy, but quite a buoyant constellation of um, indigenous civil society organizations in Nuevo León, working mainly in Monterrey. The issue of traditional authorities and the relationship to the, the territory um, of origin, now that seems to be the older generations um, who are participating in that sense um, much more. Um, a lot of them beyond the, civil, the official civil society organizations are asking local authorities money for money mainly to be able to carry out their traditional sort of festivities. That seems to be one of their main asks. And some of them go back to the communities and exercise political leadership roles and um, back in their sort of communities of origin, but that's like a different generation. Um, and often in the Mexican press, we hear that women don't get much of a say in indigenous communities. That's not always true. Um, I've spoken to indigenous women who go back to their community who have gone back and, and um, carried out sort of a, a, a role for a year. A third way of sort of political organization or where this becomes obvious is in consultations. I mentioned that in Los Angeles, in 2019, there was a big sort of forum of consultation carried about, out by the Mexican government. Well, there have been several consultations since 2011. Um, in Nuevo León, some carried out by the federal government, some carried out by municipal or state level governments. And this is a really mixed bunch of experience. Um, but what it does show there is the kind of great, the great variety of indigenous realities in the same sort of situation. So if you think about the ancestral um, territories or municipalities, obviously it's probably one or maybe two indigenous peoples living in the area. Now in the city, you've got representatives of all, virtually all of the 60 um, indigenous peoples um, in, in Mexico. So this makes it very complicated in terms of participation, as well as the issue of authorities, who's a legitimate authority, um, how is the participation, participation structured? So these series of consultations, um, I wouldn't say there was a book of best practices there, um, but they do show up some of these sort of like um, difficulties and contradictions in terms of participation when there's such a diversity of um, representation within the uh, municipality. And my last point is that in the last um, elections, local elections in, in Mexico, there was the first indigenous candidate um, for uh, an electoral district in Nuevo León. Um, unfortunately, he didn't win, um, but that's a big sort of watershed moment in terms of the visibility of indigenous peoples in an area which would never consider itself indigenous. And all of a sudden we have a candidate representing the indigenous community of part of Nuevo León. So I just wanted to share that with you. I'm not sure how many minutes um, that's been. I wasn't timing, but I presume it's about 10 minutes. Um, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kea, for these really interesting insights into this US-Mexican uh, context and in the challenges and dynamics indigenous peoples are facing in order to get their voices heard and in order to kind of access their political rights. Um, so I assume this, uh, of course, triggers a lot of questions, hopefully. Uh, just re remark to the esteemed audience, don't forget uh, the Q&A section is open. Uh, you can already now pose your questions. And finally, without further ado, sorry for keeping you waiting, Alexandra, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. And first of all, a big, really big, big, big thank you to both uh, Philip and Claire for, for having accepted our invitation, but also to my colleagues at URAC and at the Institute for Minority Rights in particular for really uh, getting care of all the technical issues for organizing this webinar and of course, uh, this kicking off the series. So um, actually I would like to raise also um, myself two dimensions with regard to indigenous urbanization and mobility. And I will start actually first with um, what regard an involuntary, let's say, uh, mainly uh, movement of indigenous peoples. And uh, I will try to connect a little bit, um, of course, immigration that Claire was speaking about. Uh, so the, the indigenous, sorry, the, the migrant caravans that of course include a lot of indigenous peoples that from Central America are trying to enter into the USA. And, um, and this is also part of the indigenous mobility, which is, is linked to climate change and, and land uh, degradation. Um, so here I geographically focus on, on, on the Americas. Um, so wishing to point out how climate change adverse effects per se, such as persistent droughts, desertification, flooding, but many others effects heavily impact on land degradation and that's become an additional factor of indigenous mobility. So we have heard from Philip, of course, now the majority of indigenous peoples are, are living in urban context and uh, living in urban context is not absolutely not a new thing. But what I'm trying to, uh, to add here is just this additional 
dimension of climate change uh, effects that per se can trigger further indigenous mobility. So um, for example, there are also other cases linked to um, sea level rise and coastal erosion. And here we can pick up the case of the Gunayala, for example, in Panama. This, uh, um, islands essentially that are um, that are eroded and uh, there has been um, a, a program of managed retreat or planned relocation of the Gunayala to relocate on Panama mainland. But this is also happening in Alaska, for example, with the Kivalina Island that is essentially falling into, into the sea. So, but at the same time, it's not only climate change uh, adverse effects per se, but also climate change uh, measures, so both adaptation and mitigation measures, that can actually have an in, a negative impact on indigenous peoples and trigger um, mobility, uh, further mobility. So for example, if we keep pick up the case of planned relocations and manage retreats, um, they, um, those that have, uh, that have uh, occurred so far that luckily are not so, uh, so many, but still, had had a lack um, in taking in co into consideration, for example, the role of traditional authorities or spiritual leaders, or a lack of participation, including consultation, as also Claire was mentioning, of indigenous peoples that were um, involved in the in the planned relocation. So a lack of cooperation with indigenous peoples in the design of the of the planned relocation lack of gender specific measures uh, of communitarian and development plan and also a monitoring system of the uh, relocation um, per se so this uh, apart from you know having a relocation due to uh, climate gen uh, adverse effects so you having a managed retreat then this trigger further mobility because then indigenous peoples are unable to settle in the new settings so they further move on and then the second dimension is that uh, bring us a little bit more to Europe. Uh, and it regards uh, uh, both voluntary, I mean, it regards more, um, more voluntary movement of indigenous peoples, but not, uh, not necessarily. So there, there is an increasing number of uh, urbanized, as, as we call them uh, in one of our projects, uh, Europe, urbanized indigenous migrants here in Europe as well. In this regard, both those, let's say, in inverted commas, European indigenous peoples, such as the Sami in the three Nordic countries, such as Sweden, um, Sweden, Finland, and Norway, while Sami also live in Russia, and but also of those trans transnational migrants that are coming, for example, to from Latin America and settling them down uh, in Europe, coming to Europe, but that they tend to disappear into the official statistics as they were uh, migrants from uh, the different countries of, of Latin America. So regarding indigenous peoples of Europe, let's say, uh, so the Sami, uh, also in, this, in the case of Sami, the majority of them live in, uh, in urban context, but in that in that case, there are also a tiny minority, sorry, a tiny minority of the of the Sami, in the sense of a, of a tiny percentage of Sami people that are still practicing traditional activities in the homeland. It's, it's about 10% of this of the total Sami people in the three Nordic countries. And for them, migrating and moving is also part of their culture, so traditional culture and way of life. But apart from this really tiny percentage, the majority of them have been settled in urban centers. And, uh, and this may lead also to the invisibility of their culture and also a partial loss of, of their identity. But also, as, as also Claire was mentioning, um, this may lead also to uh, further organization. So getting organized uh, as Sami people and Sami organizations within the cities. And, and then, Let's not forget about also the fact that cultures in general are evolving, are not static at all. And this is particularly the case of indigenous peoples and indigenous cultures. So um, they can, Sami people in the cities are simply nurturing also the natural evolution of their culture um, in the new, let's say, uh, urban context. Um, or not new. Um, so, but in Europe, we also observe movements that are less voluntary, definitely involuntary, such as in the case of the Russian Federation, 
Um, well, Russia officially recognized only about 40 indigenous peoples that are only those that are numbered less than 50,000 uh, members. As the indigenous small numbered peoples of the North of Siberia and the Far East, and here, both here in, I mean, there in Russia, land dispossession, extractive industry, also as in other parts of the world, but generally an over really overall lack of application and respect for their rights, are really triggering um, huge uh, flows of migration, and often uh, which results in urbanization, but uh, living really at the at the fringes of the urban context. And this weakens, of course, a lot their resilience the possibility really to to adapt and uh, and uh, uh, be resilient so um and that's and that's somehow the european uh the european context but then uh with regard to the, the to the transitional transnational migrants so coming over to europe those coming for example from latin america here there is a mix of voluntary and voluntary movement. And for example, regards Quechua, a lot of Quechua people coming from Ecuador, but also Shuar, and uh, that have settled in the last decades, especially in the southern part of, of Spain. And here was what's interesting, what has been observed in the empirical research, uh, little empirical research has been conducted with, with them, is, um, is first of all that they actually experience more discrimination, so they feel more discriminated against than in their own country. Uh, and the levels of discrimination against indigenous peoples in Ecuador are anyhow high, uh, because they're not only discriminated against by Spaniards, for example, but also by their uh, fellow Ecuadorians that are non-indigenous, but also other migrants. And, and therefore, this has uh, lead, led to a kind of ghettoizations. But also, on the other hand, on the construction of networks, international networks, and that help them to um, that support essentially the migration of other indigenous peoples from from their own communities to come over to Europe, and at the same time also the creation of organizations. So similarly to what Claire was saying, they also organized their own organizations and for celebrating on uh, festivals, cultural festivals, and cultural activities and events, etc. And in this sense, it's also interesting also the, um, what the indigenous Mapuche community in Europe is doing, particularly in the Netherlands. And uh, they really continue to, uh, to strive for celebrating their, their cultural events. So, and even before, especially before COVID, they were really trying to organize, for example, their Wetripantu, which is the celebration for the new solar year, which happens on the Austrian um, winter solstice, which is at the end of June. So when we have the summer uh, solstice here in Europe, and despite, of course, being totally uh, away from their own, um, their own ancestral lands. So that is today's Chile and Argentina. So these are just few few examples, empirical examples that follow up also what Claire and Philip um, are saying and add further, further dimensions to, to indigenous organization and, and migration. And, and in particular, I would like to, uh, to finish by saying that um, with regard to the transnational indigenous migration to Europe in particular, there is really a need to conduct a lot of empirical analytical work. And this is a challenge that we would like to um, uh, pursue to, to face and, uh, and therefore conduct research in this. We are already conducting research in this, in this field and hopefully we will have uh, some empirical results by, by next year. And yeah, and with that, I will stop here. So looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and thank you so much to all of our speakers, and especially now, Alexandra, you touched upon some quite interesting and actually very topical um, yeah, themes like climate change and how it's impacting uh, voluntary and involuntary, mainly involuntary migration of uh, indigenous peoples. And I was quite intrigued by your statement that actually this uh, fosters or enables also the, the formation of a new reorganization in order to preserve culture and identity. And I guess these are topics which, uh, of course, need, for, need further research and further investigations and could be open for debate. I'm just watching now the question and answer section. So far, there is none. So um, 
in order, please, the audience get active. Um, but I will uh, kick off a question which comes to my mind now, having listened to all our presentations. Um, actually, quite plainly stated, how actually are um, many indigenous peoples that have been forced to migrate or that come to the urban context, how are actually they um, exercising their rights? May they even exercise their rights in the new urban setting? And if so, how? What's your uh, take on this? Um, this question goes mainly out to all of you three. So may I ask you for a brief statement on that uh, first uh, kickoff question? Thank you. Philip, uh, do you want to start, maybe? Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, happy, happy to happy to start. Um, first of all, I would say I think it's it's important to say that I think not everyone who is indigenous and migrates to cities is forced to do so. Uh, so there's I think, uh, there's important uh, motivational differences to consider, and there's also, of course. Uh, like I think the, an intersectionality lens has a really lot to offer because we find significant class differences. So, for example, if you look at uh, uh, cities like El Alto, you've got a growing Aymara bourgeoisie that lives in the city, and uh, that is uh, in many ways uh, exercising their rights through the capital uh, they obtain. So, like it's. Um, then, then I think also another question is what what are indigenous rights in cities? Uh, so there's 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 a number of, of claims that that need to be considered here. I think uh, many like previous work I've conducted in in, in Ecuador and Bolivia suggests that. Uh, uh, people certainly claim rights which we con would consider otherwise universal to housing to to, to services uh, and engage. Uh, actually in organizations that go beyond the indigenous identity, be that a neighborhood organization, school boards, uh, and are very active in that. Um, at the same time, uh, what, we, what we can find uh, in, in many cities, and that came, I think, through very nicely also in Claire's talk, is that uh, the formation of associations within the city, um, uh, that can be for self-help purposes, that can be to generate cultural spaces, um, in uh, again in, in, in Ecuador, uh, for example, we also find comunas, which are actually uh, indigenous territories collectively inhabited, that exist within indigenous spaces, uh, within within urban spaces. So there's also um, already sort of governance models uh, within within cities. So I think there's a there's a there's a broad spectrum, but I think the the key take home message, and I think that links to what Alexandra said, is that discrimination uh, and levels of exclusion are exacerbated among this group. Um, and due to the lack of recognition of indigenous rights and also indigenous organizations within cities, um, it is oftentimes quite hard. And uh, so there's, there's no one size fits all answer, but I, I would say it's, 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 it's rather diverse. And I hand over uh, to Claire and Alexandra to finish my rambling. Thanks. Um, that was excellent rambling. And it's a really good question um, to you, Kirsten. I just wanted to mention again from experience, how, how do Indigenous migrants exercise their rights? Well, I want to talk about three factors that can affect how, at least in my experience in Monterrey, Mexico, um, how they can exercise their rights. Two are problematic and one is a facilitator. Okay, so two factors. The first factor is birth certificates lack of in invert in, in uh, brackets um i don't know what it's like in in italy in england or uk you need like an address to exist if you don't have an address you don't exist for a bank or for an employer or whatever uh, i mean in mexico if you don't have a birth certificate you don't exist and what happens for many indigenous migrants is they don't come with a birth certificate with them um and they have difficulty trying to access that to be able to access certain social programs um in the city. So um, bearing that sort of very basic but difficult reality in mind, um, the sort of national, it was the Comisión para el Desarrollo de los Pueblos Indígenas, now it's the INBI, um, had like a module in Monterrey and basically the idea there was to help people get access to their birth certificate directly and cut through all the bureaucracy because without that you can't do anything. That's like the basic rights to identity. Um, so I think there are still people suffering from that but there's been an improvement, that's like a policy area, improvement on people being able to access a birth certificate. Um, outside the community. Um, another issue which is a problem for the exercise of rights in the city is obviously Indigenous people have constitutionally in Latin America have individual rights and collective rights. So how are the collective rights exercised in a context whereby 
very few of the communities sort of live together um, and there's no kind of direct um, relationship with the land and territory as it could be in rural areas. So that's another obstacle to exercising rights in the city. What are the facilitators? Um, Philip mentioned again the idea of um, organisations and networks, that's super important. But I think the opportunity to get access to higher education, sort of basic education, higher education, funds, funding opportunities, grants, um, other pots of money in urban areas that tend to have a bit more um, wealth, that's a facilitator, I think, in terms of um, the exercise of indigenous rights, because that's an instrument, right, um, to be able to demand certain things. So it's a really, really important question, and there's all sorts of realities. But in my experience, something as basic as not having a birth certificate means you're out of the map. And how do you get that if you can't go back to your community in Michoacan? And, and the government, I mean, crikey, I have lots of personal anecdotes about bureaucracy in wonderful Mexico, but it can be very sort of Kafkaian in the best case scenario. So having a government module who can help you get your birth certificate is really, really important. It's really basic. Yeah, and perhaps, yeah, from my side, I would like to bring in... Um... Yeah, the principle of territoriality, right? So, which is can be both um, a good, let's say, legal instrument as well as, uh, yeah, a limited, um, a limitation to the exercise of, of rights. So, um, I mean, I totally, I totally agree with Philip, and uh, when saying that indigeneity is really, especially in legal studies, is really linked to the indigenous people still live in the rural harmonious way in their lands and so on and so forth, which is not absolutely the truth uh, anymore, or at least it, 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 is, it is the reality of a uh, of, of number of indigenous peoples, but that definitely not all of them and, and not really the majority anymore. So uh, there is a need to think about how to exercise indigenous rights in the city. So as Philip was rightly saying, I mean, all of us are entitled to, uh, all of us are holders of our individual rights everywhere in the world in principle, <laughs> in principle, according to our dear international law and human rights law. But, um, but of course, uh, if you're located within, within the country, of course, you are still entitled to your constitutional rights then. Uh, but somehow, um, and all the time, so sorry, that if you change perhaps a region or even a province, uh, then your rights can change. And this, for example, happens in, in Canada from a province to another. So some rights that are recognized in British Columbia are not necessarily recognized in the nearby, in the nearby provinces, but also in Russia, for example, there are uh, some uh, uh, rights that are recognized in some units, federal units, but not in others. And indigenous peoples uh, can, uh, can enjoy those rights only if they live uh, in, in that specific uh, uh, region. And, uh, but leaving apart somehow the, of course, the land rights, which are absolutely fundamental to indigenous peoples, still indigenous people could uh, claim uh, to, um, to exercise their own cultural, cultural rights also in the cities, because that, that would be, of course, something that could, should be applied definitely at a national level. And also something that has been really less explored in the case of indigenous peoples and, and Latin America in particular could be also some cases of uh, non-territorial autonomies. So what this is a concept uh, we are familiar, very familiar with in Europe with regard to minorities, but could be also interesting to explore in the case of indigenous peoples and the exercise of their rights. So having I don't know, for example, education or cultural committees that uh, involve indigenous peoples at national level, irrespective of where they are living. So something, uh, something that could be, for example, yeah, similarly to the Sami parliament in Europe, for example, but something to be explored, of course, more. And then a last point is actually uh, for those living in, uh, in Europe, so those transnational migrants living in Europe, which is interesting because we have European countries that have ratified, for example, the ILO Convention 169, which is, I think all of you know, that is the only binding treaty in the case of indigenous uh, peoples, and indigenous rights. And uh, for example, has been ratified by Spain or Luxembourg recently. So in principle, indigenous peoples living in these countries could even think to you know, claim an application of those rights, but this is totally to be totally explored. This is that's something that hasn't been really even discussed so much yet. 
So, but in principle, this, this is also a paradoxical uh, effect of the principle of territoriality, for example. Yeah, we stop here. Thank you so much to all of you for pointing out this uh, quite very practical uh, problems uh, indigenous peoples are facing through their migration or forced or in uh, voluntary whatever. Um, now my follow up would be what's then the role of international bodies, international conventions, international organizations in order to improve uh, these challenges, these hurdles, because Al Alexandra now said the ILO convention, uh, Claire, you mentioned rightly all these organizations there. So what's actually the role of these bodies? How can they improve? What's the role of the international national organization. Um, may I now reverse the order out of a surprise? Sorry, Alexandra, it's you, please, uh, for us to go on. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, well, you, I mean, UN, of course, and other international organizations, World Bank, uh, International uh, Monetary Fund, etc. So they have really a key role in general with regard to indigenous uh, people's rights. But with regard to indigenous migrate, urbanization and, uh, and migration still, I think that, for example, uh, it should be so there has been attention, for example, by the, the expert mechanism of indigenous people's rights uh, to look at uh, indigenous migration a couple of years ago. So do we have the, there is this report of 2019, and now they are finally focusing on indigenous urbanization. But I think that the most important thing would be really to change the approach. So as really Philip has said before, so being indigenous doesn't really mean anymore to be uh, or at least it doesn't mean only to be living on a traditional land and being, you know, kind of stereotype indigenous person living in perfect harmony with the with the nature, etc. So it's really kind of change of paradigm uh, that that would really lead to to further work. And I pass it on to Claire, I guess. Yeah, as, as Alexandra was saying, the role of um, international organizations is really important and highlighting the problem and um, investigating the problem. I don't know, for example, in Latin America, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and its sentences have been super important. I'm not sure if they said anything about migratory processes and indigenous rights, um, but it'd be good if they could, for example, <laughs> that'd be quite helpful. Um, but one thing I did find, at least um, in Nueva León in Mexico, whenever there was like a sort of legal challenge by indigenous groups, they'd always refer to international law. That's the, the, the ILO convention and UNDRIP, and that would always be like a framework. So um, you come in before, Alexandra, about how in certain systems and federal systems, um, in one state you may have certain rights, in another state you don't have those rights. Um, and that happens in Mexico too. So the indigenous populations spread between two states might have very different sort of legal frameworks. But because in countries like Mexico, where international law has the same level as constitutional, the national constitutional local law, it doesn't shouldn't really matter because people can refer to international law um, when they sort of um, bring about proceedings for certain omission of, of rights. And we've seen that in Mexico, um, both in migratory and non-migratory contexts. There are a lot of legal cases brought about by indigenous peoples are based on international law, the instruments of international law. So there is a, a sense by which when to avoid having legal cases when uh, local governments who have indigenous people in their sort of territory, so to speak, are aware of the implications of international law, that means that it's more likely they will create policy, you know, and be aware of their obligations under international law. Sometimes it has to happen through sort of lead, um, what do they call it in, in English? It's jury, um, what's it called? Um, it's like uh, the strategic juridical persecution, litigio strategico, strategic litigation, there you go, sorry, strategic litigation, that's what it's called, um, you know, it may be through that process, it may be because the authorities themselves are aware of it, but I think that whole um, sort of framework is super important, particularly in federal confusing, with all due respect, <laughs> confusing federal legal frameworks. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I think I concur with Alexandra saying that I think a starting point would, first of all, be putting the topic on the table um, and and also incorporating it in, I think incorporating a more up-to-date understanding of uh, yeah, what, what indigeneity actually means. And that shouldn't be a, a relatively difficult process um, because we, we do have uh, a lot of urban indigenous representatives engaging in the UN permanent forum. Um, like we, we can, again, in Bolivia, you can observe that uh, members are part of their 
indigenous territory in an extended way. So, for example, the uh, the Lowland Indigenous Fund uh, Foundation CDOP has its seat in Santa Cruz, and our residents in Santa Cruz are organized in this organization at district level, at city level, and national level, and automatically through that at international level. So, there's certainly lobbying efforts uh, ongoing and talking to uh, a lot of a lot of the people I'm working. There's, uh, I think, the the other uh element of, of simply the power of institutional uh, international frameworks uh and, and the power of recommendation that oftentimes comes with that so for example um through through frameworks such as the sustainable development goals to to push states essentially uh to cooperate with organizations of different backgrounds uh push to provide employment and economic uh, and educational opportunities and address, for example, uh, the specific medical and legal needs of indigenous peoples on the ground. So I think that is certainly something uh, that, that needs to be considered, but in, in an increasingly loose environment where frameworks such as the SDGs uh, very much dependent on, on domestic uptake, the, the question of the, of the power of these instruments certainly uh, needs to be raised. Um, so yeah, so much to that. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you. In uh, With due respect to the time, uh, we only have uh, 45 minutes left. I would very briefly ask you for your last take, each of you, please. When you think of the future, what will be the most uh, difficult challenges or all the challenges coming up now within the next uh, couple of years indigenous people are facing? Um, and may I start again uh, with Philip, please, very briefly. I know it's a super broad <laughs> topic, but just uh, also a bit of a teaser to follow up your work, because I guess there will be a lot uh, uh, of, of you coming out in the next years on these topics. Thank you, Philip, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, so that the, I think there is now a question in the chat, which is uh, for Claire. So maybe we can, uh, but maybe maybe Claire can just take that up as well, but just to just to flag it. Uh, uh, issues to consider in in the coming years. I think uh, there's there's certainly something to be done around. Uh, in general, the reconfiguration of indigenous identity, uh, especially with uh, among among younger generations, um, uh, I think there's certainly also something to be done methodologically. And I think this self critique, uh, like I think in, in increasingly having like there, there's a lot of very strong indigenous researchers out there, and uh, I think their that their voices uh, should be incorporated better. Within, within seminars, debates, discussions, and within research projects uh, that, that, that tackle these issues. So, so that is uh, the, uh, another issue. I think the issue of climate change uh, and mega infrastructure projects remains pertinent uh, from my perspective. Uh, across Amazonia in particular, we've got uh, new, new urban settlements emerging, an array of large-scale infrastructure projects that are affecting indigenous territories directly, either bringing urban features to them or pushing them into the city. So I think um, there's a need to work at the, at the micro scale within smaller cities and within metropolitan areas, but I think there's also uh, really an important element to look at this both at the, sort of at regional and, 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 and global configurations. So um, elements such as USA or uh, the Silk Road project and their implications for local territory strike me as incredibly important. And uh, with that obviously comes the comes the issue of, of climate change, which I think should not be um, ignored. So I think these are some some broader and challenging topics to which I've got no answer, but uh, that I think certainly require researching in different regions across the world. Thank you. Thanks. I'll just again echo what Philip's saying in a way and answer the question. Thanks very much, Nicola, for your question about the sort of legal background or frameworks for consultations and organisations in Los Angeles. I think there, what I'd very quickly say is that I think. You know, with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been very much, we're very much more aware of the inability of certain types of governance structures and legal frameworks to deal with problems because problems cross borders. And the, the pandemic has been a prime example of that. We're much more aware, I think, of governance structures. And I think it's the same for indigenous migrants. As Alexandra was saying, you know, you might have an indigenous migrant from Ecuador in Barcelona, but the government has a responsibility under the ILO convention. And the case of um, 
California, I suppose, and Oaxaca, this uh, kind of twin cities for indigenous brothers and sisters, um, is a prime example of that. How do you create a legal and political framework that can kind of absorb those demands and that situation of like a transnational community? So uh, taking up Nicola, Nicola's um, question and going back to Philip's um, comment, I think that's a really key issue in the future. Um, one of the very key issues in terms of um, urbanized indigenous people, indigenous migration, is what sort of governance and legal framework can deal with um, with the situation, claims making disputes, you know, um, at certain points. So thanks for the question and I'll close with that. Thank you. So yeah, for my side, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with Philip and, and Claire's points. And, and perhaps what I, what I would like to point out is also um, to look at the internal dynamics within uh, these indigenous um, migrant organizations, but also indigenous migrants and their diasporas. So uh, looking at, uh, I don't know, um, potential in, kind of intra-community uh, discrimination patterns. So we don't have to forget about, about that. So what happens to indigenous migrants once, uh, once they are settled in the, new, in the new context, not only in terms of identity or culture, but really also with regard to, to their resilience also especially hopefully in a post-pandemic scenario so yeah so that would be my main point for the next years well um having said that leaving that with alexandra's uh, notes i have to thank now all uh, of you esteemed speakers for this very insightful talk and to the audience as well for joining us with this in this conversation in this very interesting hour i hope you enjoyed it thanks again to all our panelists and please as if this was the first uh, episode of the webinar, to uh, stay with us on the 21st of October, we will have the next session uh, in which we will explore migration, agriculture and rural development. Again, with uh, one colleague of Eurac, this time Marcia Bona, but joined by esteemed uh, guest speakers uh, like Dominika Farinelli and Michele Nuri. So please turn in and register for this. And now, thanks again for this insightful discussion to all our speakers, to all our attendees. Um, I'm closing the session now and have a good uh, last uh, evening. Uh, no, not last evening. <laughs> have a nice evening and hopefully um, stay with us and stay healthy and safe. Thank you. <laughs>